Welcome everybody to TechCraft, this is Rob and in today's video I'm going to talk you through Homebrew. I just uh, did a complete reinstall of my MacBook and did a clean install, so I've got nothing on there other than the operating system and the first thing I install on any Mac, whether it's a reinstall or a fresh, uh, fresh machine, is Homebrew. And you might ask yourself, what is Homebrew? Well, it's a package manager. And you might ask yourself, what's a package manager? And basically this is a piece of software you use to install and manage other software. The packages being managed are your software packages. And if you've used Linux before, you'll be familiar with this because most Linux distributions have a package manager built in. But on Windows and on Mac, this is not something you get by default. And Homebrew is an open source project which brings a package manager to Mac. There's an equivalent for Windows called Chocolatey, which I've never really used in Anger, but if you're a Windows user, you can you know, try that out and I guess get a similar experience. And the question really is, well, why would I want to use software like Homebrew to install and manage my software? I could just go and download it off the internet and install it myself. Well, I think there are three main reasons. The first reason is it's a little bit easier to use Homebrew to install something than it is to go to that the website for that piece of software to download a zip file, to unpack it, blah, 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 blah. That's especially true if you have to find the dependencies for that software. You know, if you're going to download something like uh, HTOP, it depends on a couple of libraries. You have to get those libraries as well. So, you know, using Homebrew is a bit easier. While I think installing is a great benefit for Homebrew, the big benefit for me is updates. Uh, with Homebrew, it will tell me when there's an update for my software package and it will install it for me. So I don't need to troll the internet keeping up to date with all my software. Absolutely brilliant, fantastic. Then the third benefit is with Homebrew, you can capture all the things you have installed on your machine in what's called a brew file. And then later on, you can replay that brew file. So if you do a clean install like I'm doing, or if you have a new machine and you want to get all your software on there, then rather than have to one by one by one install all those packages, you can just say to Homebrew, here's my brew file, please bring me up to date. And that's a super useful mechanism for kind of keeping your machines in sync. Let's dive straight in with how to install Homebrew. Okay, so I'm here and this, like I say, is a complete fresh install of the Mac. I've done very, very few things to it just to make uh, the, the actual screencast a little bit nicer. And I have opened up the Brew homepage, it's brew.sh. I'll link that in the description. And what you're going to do is we're gonna copy this here, uh, bin slash bash and a few other things. We're gonna copy that and we're going to paste that into a terminal window. I have a terminal open here. Your terminal might look a little bit different. I've just made mine a little bit simpler for the purposes of this, of this video. Um, paste that in and that will do the install. You'll need to type in your password. And this is just so that Homebrew can do a few admin things it needs to do, create certain directories and so on and so forth. Because this is a brand new Mac and you may need the same as well, you need to install the Xcode command line tools. If you're a developer, you'll probably already have these installed. If you're not, just hit return and it will install them. It does take a little while. After the install finishes, you'll uh, be presented with this instruction here to uh, run these two commands. And you'll see if we just run brew now, it doesn't work. And the reason for this is that the shell that we're running, that's the, that's the application that's running inside terminal that listens to our commands. It doesn't know about the brew command yet. We need to tell it about that. I'm actually going to run these in reverse order. So I'm going to take this command here. Um, I'm going to copy that and then paste it and run it. And now brew is a command that the shell knows about. Okay, fantastic. But next time we start the shell, it won't know about that command again, uh, unless we do this command here, echo, eval, blah, blah, blah. So just copy those two commands and run them as instructed. And now we have a, a shell that can run brew and each time we create a new shell, it'll be able to run brew as well. Let's now actually install our first piece of software. And the first piece of software I typically install on a new machine after homebrew is Firefox. So I can just type brew install Firefox. And we'll see it's tapping homebrew slash cask. Uh, taps are the homebrew mechanism, like kind of repositories of software or like directories or databases, if you will. And casks are software that has a GUI and they're typically these pieces of software live in your applications folder. Contrast these with uh, brews, which are all the other kinds of software you can install with homebrew. So you're installing either casks or taps and you're, sorry, either casks or brews and you're installing those from taps. And often what you'll find as you're using Homebrew is it will run a new tap to find new sources of software or sometimes a software vendor will tell you, um, install this tap to get this piece of software. But for now, we're just gonna get the default tap for Firefox. So that's Firefox installed and I can even try to open it up with uh, 
spotlight and you'll see there is there is Firefox and it's all on my machine. Okay, great. And if you want to check in Homebrew what's installed, then you can use the brew list command. And this will tell you everything you've got installed. And so far, all we've got is the Firefox and it tells you that it's a cask contrasting again with a brew. Now let's maybe install two more things just to see and we'll install some brews this time. Uh, I'm going to install brew, uh, brew install htop and wget. And you'll see that I can actually install two things at the same time. I can install three, four, five, there's no limit. Uh, you can install many, many applications with one command. You'll probably notice that was quite a bit quicker than installing Firefox. That's because by this time, Brew has already downloaded most of its tap information. The database is quite full, but you'll also see that quite a few things got installed. So CA certificates, OpenSSL, uh, get text so forth. These, these were things we didn't specify. These are the dependencies of the packages uh, that we need. And this is one of the major benefits of Brew is that it actually resolves and installs the dependencies for you. So if we now do a Brew list again, what you'll see is it's now got all these other things, the brews, it's called formulae here for some reason. Um, and these are the dependencies of the packages we have installed. If I now want to remove something, so let's say you actually don't want Wiget, we're going to remove that, we can do brew uninstall. And it will remove that package. Now there's a warning here saying that a file has been left behind. This is a really nice part of, of Homebrew. Anything that's a config style file where you might have edited it, it will not remove that. Uh, you have to remove that manually, but it will warn you. So you know you have to clean up, which is quite nice. Now let's just do brew list one more time. And what we'll see is that quite a lot of stuff get left behind, but I happen to know that some of these things like CA certificates and OpenSSL, they're dependencies of Wiget, but they're not dependencies of HTOP. So brew will not by default remove the dependencies. We need to do that ourselves. And we can do that with brew auto remove. So that's gone, cleaned up all of the dependencies, again, telling us that some things have been left behind because they may have been edited by us. But if we do a brew list, now we'll see that we're just back to the set of things we expect, htop and Firefox and ncurses, which is a dependency of htop. I think install, uninstall, and list are pretty intuitive commands. Homebrew gets a little bit confusing when it comes to update and upgrade. Um, you'd be forgiven for assuming that update will update the version of a, so of a software package that you have installed. You'd be forgiven for thinking that upgrade upgrades the version of Homebrew. None of those things is true. Instead, Brew Update will update the internal database of Homebrew and Brew Upgrade will upgrade a particular piece of software. Let's take a quick look at that. So I've just cleared out my terminal and I'm gonna just run Brew Update. And this is going to update the internal database, but it will tell you here already up to date. Because I'm filming this straight after just installing, everything's up to date, so there's nothing to, to upgrade. I will put some screenshots over my commentary here that show you what it would look like uh, when this machine's a few days old. To check what's out of date, I can run brew outdated, but nothing's out of date. And to upgrade, I can either run brew upgrade and then say wget or sorry, htop, which is installed, or I can just run brew upgrade with no, nothing specified and it will upgrade all of the applications. So, so far we've installed software packages that we already knew the name of. We knew the name Firefox, we knew the name htop. Let's see how we might find packages if we don't know the exact name and then install them. So I want to install the Firefox developer edition alongside the main Firefox, but I don't know the name of the package. So I can just do brew search Firefox and see what it gives me. And here we can see there's actually a few casks, uh, Firefox, multi-Firefox, so on and so forth. And the one I want is this one, Firefox Developer Edition. So I'm going to copy that name and you have to have the whole name. And um, let's just do brew install that. And you can see here it's, ta it's tapping a new tap. So it knows that this, this uh, cask comes from a different tap. So it's going to tap that. It's going to get all that database information about all of the casks in that tap. And then I'm free to install them. Okay, so that's the Firefox developer edition installed and I can actually see that if I run Firefox uh, in the spot, um, spotlight, you can see that I've now got two types of Firefox installed, which is fantastic. So the command line is obviously not for everybody and you might not really want to use a command line application to install all your other software. Thankfully, there is an open source GUI uh, front end for Homebrew called Cakebrew. So let's take a quick look at that. You probably won't be surprised to know that we install Cake Brew using Homebrew itself. So just brew install Cake Brew gives us uh, the Cake Brew installation. And now I can open up the Cake Brew app. Uh, when you install apps, especially casks or GUI apps from uh, Homebrew, 
OS X gives you this warning, OS X, Mac OS gives you this warning and you can just click open. Uh, obviously, feel free to check if you want. And here we've now got a nice little GUI on top of, of Homebrew. And what you'll see is pretty much everything we've seen so far. So these are the install. This is kind of the equivalent of brew list. Outdated, we saw, and we will have seen a screenshot of what that looks like when something is outdated. All formulae is all of the brews that you can install. And doctor is a, a handy command to tell you whether or not your homebrew installation is working. It's worthwhile running that if you have any problems. And I just want to come back here and you'll notice that I said all brews. And I was very specific about that. Cake brew doesn't work with casks. Uh, it only works with brews. So that's a slight limitation. But if you want to install, say, Magic Wormhole, which is a fantastic open source package, if you've not used it, definitely check it out. You can come here in the search for Magic, find Magic Wormhole, and then press plus, and that will install the Magic Wormhole brew. Okay, there we go. That's installed, and that will now show up in our list of installed software here in Cake Brew. And if we just close that and come back and run Brew List, you'll see that Magic Wormhole is listed here as well. So I mentioned earlier on about this notion of a brew file. That is a file that lists all the things it's installed on your machine, and you can then replay that through Homebrew. Um, let's take a quick look now about how you might get a brew file, where you might store it, and then how you would replay it into Homebrew. So first things first, let's get a copy of our brew file and we'll do that with the command brew bundle dump. And this is just gonna create our kind of dummy brew file for us. Now, if I just show you the files in this directory, you'll see that one of them is called brew file. And let's open that up. In fact, I'm just gonna use VI. And what you'll see here is first of all listed the taps. So we talked a little bit about taps. These are the repositories, the databases, if you will, of all of the software packages that can be installed. We talked a little bit about brews. These are the non-GUI applications. So we've got HTOP and Magic Wormhole. And then we've got three casks installed. These are the GUI apps that we installed. You can edit this file directly. Um, if you want, you don't have to only generate it from Homebrew. In fact, for my normal use case, I tend to just keep my brew file up to date. And maybe what we can do here is add a new brew entry for sync thing, which is a, a great piece of peer-to-peer -peer syncing software. And then we can rerun a uh, homebrew bundle. And this will say, please read our brew file and bring us up to date with what's in there. And you can see it's now installing sync thing. And it can be quite handy to just store your brew file, say in Dropbox or in iCloud or something like that. And then, you know, every week, maybe back it up. Um, and then when you start a new machine or, or whatever, you can just replay it and you're, you're good to go in a few minutes. So I just want to show one final thing uh, that can be quite confusing. And we touched on this a little bit at the start of the video. That is the difference between casks and brews. Now, most of the time, you will not need to know the difference, but sometimes it can be quite confusing. Let me show you what I mean. I'm going to install Emacs. And if you're not familiar with Emacs, uh, as a first approximation, you can think of it as a text editor, um, but let's not get into that wormhole because we could be here all day. So we'll do a brew search Emacs and we'll see what is available. And I want to highlight two things. We've got an Emacs brew and an Emacs cask. And this is where things can get confusing. Let's just do brew install Emacs and see what happens. And we get a warning immediately, treating Emacs as a formula for the cask you use, blah, 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 blah. And what we'll see is the outcome is perhaps not what we would want here. So Emacs is installed and we can run it from the command line, which is uh, just fine and it'll start up. Let's come out, oops, let's come out of that. Um, but if I want to run it as an app, it's not installed. Um, and that's because I only installed the command line version, not the, um, the cask version. So sometimes you need to specifically say you want to install the cask and not the brew. So how do we do that? Well, brew install dash dash cask emacs. Now I found that sometimes, not all the time, sometimes it pays to remove the clashing brew first. So let's just do that. Brew remove emacs. Brew uninstall Emacs. Okay, that's fine. And now we can do brew install dash dash cask cask Emacs. We can already see this is different. It's actually downloading a DMG file, so it's downloading a proper a proper a Mac app, and this will appear in our apps directory. And there we go, Emacs is now present in the applications directory and I can run it from the command line as well. 
Um, notice though, because we installed this as a cask, we do get that kind of malicious software warning, uh, which is interesting. And you actually, in this case, you have to go into the system preferences and tell Apple uh, you want to allow Emacs to run. So the title of this video really is not clickbait. I really do install Homebrew as the first piece of software on every single Mac that I have. Uh, in fact, we use Homebrew as the main mechanism for distributing Mac software and tools and so forth at my job. Um, I really think, I can't imagine, in fact, I can't think of any engineer or any professional I know who uses a Mac who doesn't use Homebrew. But what I like about Homebrew the most is there's nothing about it that makes it a really professional-centric tool. Anybody can, and in my opinion should, be using Homebrew because it's just such a, a smoother experience for installing and updating and managing your software. I really hope that this video has helped you see that Homebrew is easy, that you could use it, you can take advantage of it. And if you have any questions, obviously hit me in the comments and I can do my best to answer them. Thanks so much for watching and I'll see you in the next video.